Hello, everyone. I'm Devika Girish. I'm an editor at Film Comment Magazine uh, in New York, and I'll be moderating this next session. Thank you so much to Critics Week for inviting me. I'm very thrilled to be here. And I'm especially thrilled to be moderating this panel with uh, an absolutely stellar lineup of guests who I will call onto the stage. I'm going to start with Marek Hovorka, the director of the Yilava International Documentary Film Festival. And then we have Abby Sun, who is the Director of Artist Programs at the International Documentary Association. And last but certainly not the least, Claire Denis, filmmaker. Of yourself, everyone. Yes. Has it. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me here. Here's a mic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, thank you, all three of you, for, for joining me. Thank you to the audience for being here. Um, I want to jump into the discussion by talking. Great what you're wearing. <laughs> Claire. Yeah, you have to share, you know? Exactly. <laughs> I will remember this compliment for the rest of my life. Um, but I want to start with the topic of today's evening. Uh, I found the phrasing very interesting. It says, cinema of care, who looks after film culture? And I think it's interesting because cinema and film culture are not necessarily the same thing, and care and looking after are also not the same thing necessarily, so already it's gesturing at the many meanings that these words can have. So to start off, I wanted to ask each of you, do you care about cinema? And if you do, what that means to you? What caring about cinema means to you? Um, Claire, do you want to go first? Well, um, oh, sorry, excuse me. Is it better? Yeah. So my, sorry for my, uh, awkward English. I, I have to say, as I am French, as the word care became a sort of brand, care of this, care, care, I, I was a little bit embarrassed with the word care because it became a, a word we could use even in French, you know? And um, there was a lady uh, who spoke about cuidades, something uh, which suddenly interests me because so, somehow by going through Spanish, I, I find my own relation with the word care. Because care for me is something that is so much related to life, to be alive, and <clears throat> that I prefer when I am speaking French to forget the word care, because I think the word care reduce the, the spontaneity and the flesh, if I can say so, mm. of the, that feeling you may have for a, a garden, for a cat, for someone in the street, for somebody, um, the family, to consider that By doing that, you. what is beautiful is that you don't expect something in return. It comes from you toward nature or human beings, and you expect no reward from it. And 
And it's, the reward comes from suddenly this uh, relation, paying attention to someone or somewhere. So this is what I wanted to say about care. And maybe if you authorize me to say something, me, I, I was born in the century before where care was not called care. It was like you have it or not. And as I was a young woman trying to make film, I experienced more solitude. Mm. It was really my way of um, um, experiencing what was making film. I never thought film was linked to culture. Cinema was not linked to culture for me. It, it was a sort of um, a completely, um, not modern or new, but like a sort of the search of a energy <clears throat> coming from image and sound sometimes. And that was what I wanted. And I, I was convinced that I had to fight that loneliness because nobody was going to take care of me, yeah. who I was, what kind of person I was who wanted to become someone linked to, not filmmaking, to cinema. Because filmmaking, you press a button. Cinema, it's something different. And also cinema as a strange, unique quality is Making a film, you don't feel you're an artist. The, the word artist is even uh, neglect. You don't need to be an artist. To make, to enter the world of cinema is like a, a, a different approach of relationship to nature, people, a face, a car passing by. The woman before was speaking about landscape and landscape without human or landscape with human. As if landscape with human was like the normal thing, landscape without human was more rare, and I, I have to say, painters experienced that before. The meaning of a landscape with a character, with you, a human being, or a group of human beings, and a landscape with no human beings, no animals, just landscape, nature without uh, belongs to cinema in a very simple way. I remember, I, I finished the sentence and then I stopped. Uh, I remember I was in Djibouti making a film Beau Travail and the power of the nature there because it's full of volcano, of lava, of sulfur, the power of the landscape and the trees, the little trees, the little bush were so fragile, you know? So they were looking so deep for a little bit of water to grow or, or just to stay alive. So I, I thought, okay, um, making a film here, I have to promise to myself 
and to my comrade who was holding the camera, Agnes, never to be tempted to be attracted by the power of the landscape only and to make like characters cut lan landscape, cut characters. So I always thought maybe the best thing we could do to be um, in harmony, caring for this strange piece of land that is Djibouti, so hot, so dry, so volcanic, was maybe to never separate <coughs> the poor um, uh, human bodies, so hot, so dry, and uh, animals surviving there, you know? Always to have them together in order not to pretend you could look at the landscape without being very hot and burning, you know? Mm. That's, that's all I wanted to say uh, for now on. So you do care about cinema? <laughs> do I care about cinema? I, I, I live in cinema. I, I don't care a damn shit about cinema. <laughs> I, I, I just, it's my life, you know, it's different. Mm. I care about the people I need to care. Abby, just to reiterate, do you care about cinema? <laughs> and if so, what does that mean of to you? Of course you can. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, it's a trick question, because um, if we say no, <laughs> then what am I even doing here? Um, and also I did it, so you can say the opposite. That's true, but now um, you know I have to follow a story about Bo Travai, which I could never also Nothing I could say anyone in this room would care about. But I'm going to attempt. Um, when I think about the word care, I actually start from a quite similar place as where Claire started, which is that um, care does have this value these days. It's been commodified. It also has legal importance. Women can be jailed for negligence of care towards um, people in their lives, like children, that they are supposed to care for. Um, in the US, duty of care is not just a term that is used in cultural circles, but also has legal value. It can represent, for instance, the um, decisions that filmmakers are supposed to make in order to return an investment for people who finance their films. Um, so I'm not saying like just from a branding perspective that when I think about the word care, it's really hard to separate it from um, how it creates value and who it's creating value for. When I think about all of in documentary, because that's where I pay a lot of attention in film and Mark too, um, there was a lot of debates about an ethics of care, um, but what I see is that immediately when we name it something that is as beautifully, you know, rolls off the tongue like ethics of care that I see the big streamers and all of these multinational film corporations kind of using that in replacement of marketing schemes for documentaries that they're putting on the award circuit. So for me, a lot about how we talk about things means being very, very precise in the language. So I think about what I pay attention to, um, who I am giving time to. Um, I think about how we structure events. I think about how the institutions that we're working with are structured. I don't have any examples or um, kind of a perfect way of working through this. But um, for me, I also try to avoid the word care because um, something that's also quite interesting, I think, I want to bring up is that 
Um, I agree with Dennis that, and also the other staff of um, Critics Week that care and conflict are not in opposition, but care is positioned in opposition to harm. And um, harm is something that I do think a lot about when it comes to um, audiences. Um, and also um, in terms of in the role of documentary, in the role, world of fiction filmmaking, whatever it is that we're making, who is even around in, in the rooms to be able to be heard if they claim harm? Because what I'm finding is that oftentimes the institutions and the individuals that are kind of most being railed against, that harm is being claimed against, are actually in fact the people that are kind of closest in proximity with um, maybe the participants in their films yeah. or um, the crew members. So kind of yeah. who, what, when we are in these spaces that have this cultural value and prestige, the harm that we even hear about is actually an indication actually of money and attention that is put yeah. on bringing people into the space who can claim harm. So I'm not saying that the harm is not valid, but that this is a, a paradox that we have yet to solve. So um, I'm trying to pay a lot of attention, I guess is what I'm saying, to what this means for cinema, especially the art of filmmaking, and not just its use case value for social impact or other terms that we use in documentary. It's really interesting, and the question of harm and damage as opposed to care is something I want to come back to, but uh, I wanted to hear Marek's response to my question. And also, Marek, um, I wanted to bring up something. Uh, when we were doing sort of prep for this panel, there was something very interesting you said about confronting questions of care when it comes to the people who attend your festivals, um, filmmakers, you know, and the often like conflicting questions you have to, the, the kind of choices you have to make between prioritizing the film versus the people or the filmmakers. And sometimes the idea is that what you're showing are films, not filmmakers, is an idea you sometimes have to confront. And I'd love it if you dug into that a little bit as you answer my provocation, perhaps. Uh, you know, what does it mean for you to care about cinema? Does that mean caring about movies and the art of cinema or the people who make cinema or the people that cinema touches? Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much for such a broad question. Uh, I will try uh, my best. Uh, good evening to all of you. It's a pleasure being here on such a great panel uh, discussion. And yeah, it's, uh, we have to say if we start with the word care, that it's really a strange word. Uh, maybe because we know it uh, as a healthcare system, for example. So we think about care as a systematic, some a little bit like technical point of view, yeah? What's really weird, because it should be very human and very natural. Uh, so, but al of course, uh, words are changing their meanings and we read them differently. Um, so probably after pandemic uh, and after changes in narrative of our Western culture, uh, there is a different meaning or broader meaning of care, which was maybe very natural centuries ago. Yeah. Uh, if we talk about cinema, um, I like what Claire said, that it's, it's giving and you don't expect nothing for this. Mm. Uh, that it's, uh, it's not decision, yeah? it's not uh, mm, like that you decide uh, that you will do this and not that. I think, of course, we should reflect ourselves, but at the other hand, it's like uh, 24 hours a day. We take the position, and this is the, how we care, that we position ourselves, yeah? Uh, so if we go closer and uh, speak about cinema, uh, for me, it was very natural. <laughs> 26 years ago, in 1997, I was 17, I was, you know, interested in documentary filmmaking. I wanted to be, uh, like, I wanted to study a film school in Prague, but there were not uh, many chances to watch documentary films. So me and my friends decided to create an event and to screen films for ourselves. But we realized that we are not alone. Mm. And uh, we realized that uh, 
its event which cr really creates strong energy. And I think this is important and this is also something what's connected not only to Jihlava but to many events that, uh, you know, we are getting, I am afraid, very close to age of loneliness uh, through all these uh, technical developments we are using all the time. Uh, and these types of events, like uh, this evening, for example, is getting us closer, that we have this physical experience, that we are humans or that we live in a nature <laughs> Because even like city is a nature, yeah. It's not only mm. like woods or uh, uh, what, whatever rivers, or sea, uh, even buildings and uh, you know uh, roads and everything. It's a nature. Um, so uh, we are part of uh, of this, and uh, we have to think uh, who we are and these types of events which are bring us together and close shows us the diversity. And I think this is very crucial when I'm coming back to, to your question, how we make the selection that uh, we really show diversity. Uh, because uh, documentary and any art, uh, uh, any text is not uh, objective. If it's true, it's subjective. And for uh, nonfiction filmmaking, it's, I think, very strong that the filmmakers are experiencing something and we can share their positions during watching the films or even during the talks after the screenings, for example. So this is something what's important for us, uh, to create a power plant full of ideas. That's why Jihlava has this uh, motto, thinking through film, that it's a mm -hmm. space which creates, or it, it, it's a, it, it creates a space yeah, for, for thinking. Uh, and thinking is creative. I think this is important, yeah, that we as a humans, uh, if we want somehow feel that we are alive, we are creating and it can be very diverse, but in a way it's, it's the way uh, how we can go deeper in many things. Mm. Yeah. So I, um, I'm interested in how all your answers all touched on sort of different aspects of what we might think of as cinema, you know, cinema constitutes the people who make it, the people who show it, the images themselves. Uh, and there is a program in Critics Week uh, that is titled Aesthetics of Care, if I'm right, um, Dennis and Petra. And that's something, Claire, you and I were talking about on our way here, how you feel that that term is contradictory. And um, you, know, you raised a question of if we can speak of care in aesthetic terms. Uh, I Hello, Mike, Mike. Always because my English is bad, I, I was completely traumatized when flying to Berlin. Aesthetic of care, I thought, I, I don't even understand the connection possible, you know? And I thought, aesthetic already, it's a word uh, I don't trust mm. a lot. Uh, and, and next to care, makes care become a little bit uh, uh, dangerous too, huh? I think, <laughs> I think for me, um, it's very, there are in every culture, every part of the world, there is, there is the word to say, I will pay attention to you. I see you. I will be there. I will take you there. I, I, I will care for you. Sometimes even love you, you know? And this is um, in, you don't need the word care. The, all those words exist in every language. In, Every, the way you look, the way you touch, express that. But I want to come back to one word you share with Abby, is arm. Because for me, in, in a strange way to simplify um, industrial cinema, mm -hmm. there is a, a sort of pattern 
that you have, uh, you do harm people or someone, and then the film will bring care to the, you know? So you will resolve the, the, the pain or harm doing by a sort of resurrection of humanity suddenly. And I think... What kind of harm do you mean? I mean... Harm, you know, maybe shooting at someone okay. or, uh, or kicking an animal or a plant, mm. you know, harm as opposed to care. Mm. And I think f filmmaking has to deal with harm mm. because it's a good... Um, it's, it's like a good um, direction for a fiction, you know, if you balance arm and care, you already get something. But <laughs> it doesn't work that simple and simply. And I wanted to say, uh, for example, I remember when I discovered long time ago but I was not a child, I was already a grown-up uh, Ozu film, fiction film. O Ozu film, uh, 50, I, I have not seen 52 films he made, I've seen maybe 30. And I remember I was amazed. I thought maybe I've never seen film where there is fiction film with no judgment, People, there, there is harm in the film, and there is care, but with absolutely no judgment, no harm is low and bad, and care is high and good. It's, it's the way people live together, and there is no judgment, no moral judgment. Life is hard, sometimes, it's difficult, but at least if we could take care of each other, it, it will be a possible lifetime, you know, until the end. Mm. And I was amazed that this man living alone with his mother could invent a way to create fiction in such a um, um, different, distinct, um, uh, I would say, um, respect of our world, mm. complete respect. It takes place mostly in city, <coughs> but there is respect everywhere for a, a plant, for a person, for a train, and a train driver, whatever, respect. Mm -hmm. Going off of what Claire just said, Abby, maybe I'll turn this to you. I mean, can we speak meaningfully of care in aesthetic terms, on the, in terms of story, in terms of port representation? Or is it only meaningful to talk about care in the material dimension of how films are made and how film institutions and film workers treat each other. Mm -hmm. And the process, I guess. Yeah, I, I mean, I think part of this idea um, and the valuation of ethics of care in documentary spaces right now is to give more value to the how films are made, mm. regardless of what it is that is the images and the, that we see on screen and the sounds that we hear. Um, I think whether or not that's important, um, I mean, I personally believe that's important, but whether or not that should be the only thing that we are judging films on, um, I think that's quite complicated because another thing that these terms do is they try to signpost certain ideas that are supposedly shared values between large groups. Mm. Um, but what I've found is that people use the terms in different ways. 
Um, in particular, I'm um, actually quite careful about the way that I talk about or think about images themselves as active agents that might cause harm. And I think, Devika, that's what you were asking Claire about. What did you mean by harm? Is it actually like I'm punching someone? Or is it like the film is metaphorically, like it feels like somebody's been punched in the face? Is that something that the filmmaker is then doing? Um, I think is a question that quite a few institutions are confronting, right. um, that there are um, protests, whether on social media, call outs or call ins about certain films, um, as if the they themselves were the sole active agents. And for me, this is actually taking a lot of power away from audience um, because there is a long history of oppositional readings of films of, you know, if I walk in to see a movie in one cinema, people might be loudly heckling, you know, at a film as opposed to another cinema, they might be sitting in silence, so on and so forth. And so for me, it's like, um, the question about whether or not there can be an aesthetics of care really depends on what we kind of frame around it. Mm -hmm. um, for instance, there was a discussion earlier of the close-up in opposition to the drone shot as a less industrialized form of um, depicting nature. Um, but then I started thinking about, you know, some of my most beloved films like um, Microcosmos, Microcosmos, um, which uses the close-up really extensively, um, but also of like, um, you know, Discovery Channel in the US, um, totally anthropomorphized um, close-ups of insects and all of that. And so um, I also think of, for instance, when I was teaching documentary filmmaking um, at the university level as a teaching assistant, mm. um, I would run an editing workshop and I discovered that I mean, for several years, I had several classes of students, half of them, having grown up consuming images in the US, did not even realize that a cutaway was a cut. Like, they, they read the image as continuous mm -hmm. until it was pointed out to them. Um, and these were oftentimes students that had already gone through multiple film classes and would even use the cutaway in their own films. But then when I was at a workshop in China, on documentary film with Ruin Guan's Cao Chan Di workstation, they don't even like cutting at all because um, their audiences, they think, will see it immediately and then will perceive the image as not true because there's a cut. So there are, even with our more globalized media landscapes, there are these like really kind of oppositional, completely different readings of kind of the exact same technique. Mm -hmm. But I do think that the role of the curator and of cinema's workers is really in thinking about what context is necessary. Maybe it's not just a history of the filmmaker's filmography, but also of the cultural context of the film production and what it is that they're striving against um, and what images that they're working out of. So when I think about, you know, I guess I, I'm not actually sure whether I would term that under aesthetics of care, but when I just think about the image and what it can represent, those are the things that I think about. It is true what you say about cut. Yep. Because cut is really the, the easiest way to, um, to stop caring for a moment, you know? A cut will solve a lot of things. And if resisting this um, attraction to the cut is, is really interesting in, in film. Also in documentary, of course, and also in fiction, like, like in documentary sometime also to see something like insect or plant without a voiceover mm. and just the time for you, not a voice, 
it's very different, of course. Mm. Yeah. Marek, I'd love to uh, pick your brain on this question and maybe, you know, from the point of view of a curator, one thing I, I want to ask is, sometimes films that care about the world can also cause discomfort. They can be, the way that they demonstrate their care for a particular cause, for a particular grievance, can be through images that are disturbing, distressing, you know, and sometimes in our present context, those films can be perceived as in themselves somehow careless. Um, and are those decisions that you wrestle with as a curator? And how do you think about images that care while also wanting to maybe show films that hurt, but ultimately because they care, if that makes sense? Uh, well, uh, you, you know, it's... Uh, that's why I uh, said that uh, film is subjective. I am always suspicious when somebody says that this is true, like general true, yeah, because uh, we had some people in history who had this uh, opinion that uh, they know what's true and it didn't end up uh, uh, in a good way. So uh, I think th this is the diversity I, I was talking about, that uh, we really should know as much as possible uh, to see world, whatever topic, from different angles, and just think about it, mm. yeah? Uh, because, uh, you know, things are changing, uh, um, and we are challenging uh, really many complicated tasks, like environmental questions, for example, uh, technical revolution, artificial intelligence, uh, but in a way, we cannot solve it today. Yeah, it's a process, and I some, sometimes fear that uh, people think from today's perspective about future, but it's very complicated. Yeah, uh, very, very easy uh, example is, for example, social networks. Uh, at the very beginning, definitely, it was uh, designed as a tool for people to create communities, to be closer with those whom you know and you share some values, but. Of course, it's part of it, but definitely it's also harming society because it creates bubbles which are don't understand each other. Uh, and this is a big problem. Uh, so uh, film festival or like culture event, uh, again, like uh, uh, essayistic uh, writing or novel writing, whatever, should bring personal experience as honest as possible. Yeah. Uh, but uh, if, if I can, uh, and I mean, th this is something also uh, from Ihlava's experience. Uh, we are really interested in, in supporting cinema on the fridge, yeah? Uh, because from the border of everything, you see some things more clearly than from the center, which is very much uh, um, like uh, pushed or run by market and money and, you know, uh, power and w w whatever, but uh, f from the fringe, from the border, uh, you see uh, m matter of things, uh, what values, yeah? Uh, so, so for example, when we are talking about uh, curatorship, uh, for us it's really crucial to give a space to those who don't have the space, yeah? And this is the position of our festival, to create a space for uh, new filmmakers, filmmakers from different regions, because, for example, even speaking about Europe, we see that uh, most of the films screened at festivals in Western Europe are from Western Europe, and we label it as European cinema, but it's just part of European cinema. We actually created, uh, created um, some kind of initiative uh, that we uh, selected uh, like 16 film festivals, documentary film festivals, and we every year check the programming uh, from which regions uh, they select films. And it's really super interesting to see uh, which festivals in Western Europe care about Eastern Europe, mm -hmm. how European festivals care about Asia or South America, 
uh, what's the position of Africa, uh, so to know context, yeah, I think it's really important to not just think about the market, about the rules of those who invest money and want something back, but really to think about freedom, yeah, to think about people who care, who, who, who make things s seriously. Mm -hmm. uh, and if, if I can, uh, I, I would like to, um, to point out a few things uh, which are mentioned at our first ethical conference we organized uh, last year at a festival, which was really interesting. Last year it was just national edition, but it was super, uh, like super strong, uh, one day conference, so we decided to continue in it and uh, open it to international guest speakers, filmmakers, uh, theoricians. And for example, one of question documentary filmmakers discussed was how to call uh, people in front of the camera. Are they characters, you know? Are they uh, social actors? Uh, are they protagonists? Uh, or somebody has this uh, actor of his or her own lives? Uh, how to call these people? Because they are not, uh, you know, just uh, um, characters of, uh, of a developed story, yeah? like in fiction film. They are real people and their lives continue after the uh, film. So how we should call them? And it was interesting that uh, uh, these, di these directors somehow felt that there is a difference uh, how you work with them. And each word somehow show how the director is uh, working with this character, protagonist, mm. social actor in front of the camera. For example, yeah, that was uh, really interesting. Or if we are talking about uh, empathy, yeah, uh, and that really after a pandemic, uh, more and more people are thinking about uh, well-being, uh, uh, that, that also makes a more like, complicated uh, situation for uh, young filmmakers, because they care, and if they are documentary filmmakers, uh, uh, they know that sometimes they maybe need to harm or create a situation which is uncomfortable, but how to do it today? Uh, because, of course, everybody somehow respects that uh, these uh, people who are in films uh, are uh, like more important than these films themselves. Yeah? Or uh, they discussed, uh, they discussed uh, also like the fragility of the director because you create some kind of film. But of course, in fiction, it's very easy because uh, you let it uh, live outside of you when it's finished. Uh, it's nice that the film lives with its own life. But again, with documentary, it's a little bit different because uh, uh, you maybe didn't want to harm some protagonist, but many people think you did. Yeah. And how, what, what to do in this situation, yeah? Uh, when, when the reception of the film is completely different that you as a filmmaker wanted mm. to create, uh, or uh, how to behave in situations in edgy situations as a filmmaker, yeah? shooting somebody who is dying. It's important for the film, but it's not, again, fiction. So how to make it, even if the person who is dying agrees on it? Yeah? So there, there are m m many elements which are interesting to think, especially in terms of nonfiction, because it's more fragile. Mm. And maybe that's the reason why many documentary filmmakers are ending up with fiction or hybrid films, because they miss this freedom in documentary. Mm. I actually, thank you, Mark. I have a couple of observations. I promise I'll be quick. Just thinking back from what you said, back to aesthetics of care, there have been some trends that I've noticed recently that I think are because of this preoccupation, um, which I think is a good thing, to be very clear, um, on care, which is that I see a huge rise in personal stories, personal documentaries, but also in the fiction realm or hybrid spaces. And I think this is because um, filmmakers' family members are more likely to accept harm that is done to them, trauma, digging up trauma, because they also understand and are kin to and want to help their mm -hmm. son or daughter or sister or brother who is the director and the filmmaker. So paradoxically, some of the kind of most um, hurtful, maybe not harmful, but hurtful um, films that I see are ones that are done within the director's own family. 
Um, and then secondly, what I'm noticing in experimental film festivals is that um, there is actually, I feel like there's more and more voiceover in the essay film format instead of just putting sequencing to things together and really thinking carefully about um, order and proximity within the film itself, but because there is this type of um, kind of trying to make clear an intention of perhaps doing no harm or of care. Um, and that's become very important, I think, to filmmakers that I see working today. May I? Uh, it's about you, Marek. I wanted to say something about what happens when a documentary is finished and a fiction film is finished and the consequences and how could you call someone a character or just a person uh, I, I, I don't for, I forgot in English what you said about what it, how could you call someone you film I think Maybe it's a little bit old fashioned to say that, but I think the notion of power, the notion of being above, the notion of being, um, to have the power is um, to capture um, human beings in a documentary is also a, a very political situation. I, um, three weeks ago, I was in a museum in Paris and I, there was a sort of small exhibition of image from documentary or picture made in Africa uh, in the 30s or in the 50s when it was, let's say, colonial images of film, and of course, maybe that person was filming a tribe that was dancing like that, a tribe where women were half wearing um, no bra, half naked, but it's, uh, you can read immediately what, what is the position of the person who is filming. Is it to make a statement about this tribe somewhere in Africa uh, or it is you trying to connect with people you don't know the language, you don't know the culture, but you would like to care for them and sharing something. And immediately you see that uh, question of uh, power. Mm -hmm. Who is the master? This is really... Yeah, yeah, if I can comment on this very briefly, this is what mentioned one filmmaker, uh, Adela Komerzi, who made a film about palliative care. Mm -hmm. And uh, she said that uh, she was at this moment of uh, shooting somebody who's dying, and the person wanted to make this uh, like uh, moment part of the film. Uh, and she said that, that like, she realized she cannot do it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's so powerful moment that she Things that this is not for the film, but then the doctor who who is member of this palliative care unit uh, talked to her and said, "But she wants it, so it's about you how you do it." But but uh, this uh, this person would like to document uh, this moment, so she said, "Okay, uh, I needed some time. I, I went there. Uh, it was in the hospital and." Uh, I, uh, it, from the back perspective, I realized that I had aesthetic decision, position for the film, aesthetic language. And thanks to this position also of aesthetic language, not only of ethical language, she found a way how to shoot it and make it uh, like natural part of the film. 
So, I, I mean, this is also interesting uh, comment that it's not only about uh, uh, positioning ourselves, you know, in, in like mind perspective, how we think about things, but because it's cinema, also in aesthetical language, uh, how to shoot, uh, uh, because otherwise it can end up how we can, uh, you know, we, we know these images, uh, but they, they don't, they are not powerful. Mm. But she found a way, but she was ready for that moment to to make make it. Mm. It's it's uh, my my mo my mother was dying, and I was shooting f not close from home, and I remember I I was with her the last day, and for a strange <coughs> I don't understand how I did it. I made a picture of her. <coughs> and she was looking into the lens. And this image, I know where it is. I never show it to my brother and sister. And <coughs> I'm almost ashamed to have it. I know it's somewhere. But on that quick moment, my mother was looking at me into the lens, and it was so strong. Um, of course, it was my mother, but I, it was a human being close to death, and me alive, you know? Mm. So I, and this image, I know I will never show. It's somewhere. Thank you for sharing that, Claire. That's, um, oh. and <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel like everything that the three of you just brought up brings up the question of the harm that cinema can do because filming, making a film can be an act of power, as Claire said, like the camera itself is a relation of power. There's a relation of power between the person who's filming and the person who's being filmed, the person who's being recorded for a purpose and the person who is benefiting from that purpose. And uh, I was reminded of something the artist Colleen Smith uh, said at a talk at Film at Lincoln Center uh, last year, where she said, all you need to tell an entire neighborhood of people how to live their lives, all you need is to go get a permit to film. You just need to go to the city and get a permit to film. And you can shut down the neighborhood, you can ask people, you know, you can change how people live. And then she used that as an example to talk about how filmmaking can be so violent economically, environmentally, it can cause a lot of harm. And I guess my question is like, how, how do we care about cinema while accounting for A, all the harm that it can do? But also keeping aside the idea of harm, caring for something means sometimes not caring for something else. Caring means attention. So if you're paying attention to something, it means there is something else you could be caring about that you are not caring about. So how do we, I mean, even today, while we were having this conversation about care and cinema, there was a demonstration going on outdoors about the earthquake in Turkey and Syria that has taken, I mean, many thousands of lives, right? So how do we justify caring about cinema when there are so many other things to care about is a question I grapple with all the time. And I'm curious how you reconcile that question and if you think that caring for cinema is meaningful to you and if you can do it in a way that isn't harmful. Um, do I answer? Yeah, uh, I mean, for me, um, yeah, I was watching also on the, but I mean, for me, when I am watching the film, when I am in the audience, I can see immediately if the director or woman or man or is caring, not for the story, but for a face, a body, a way of walking, someone, there is, I think, sometime, I used to, 
I, I am it, it, very naively, uh, I said when I start making film, my first film, I said, the only thing I want is the beauty of my actors. Not beauty in sense of I want them to be beautiful, but I know there is a way to film someone in a way knowing that you could see the vibration of that person. You could see th that vibration is the beauty. You could see that it's the, I don't want to say the word angle, but it's the high is okay. The, the, the person you're filming is not uh, used by the angle. <coughs> it's um, beautiful, yeah, beautiful, like a tree could also, has to be beautiful also. I think if it's, if this does not exist in filmmaking, me, I think I'm not interested. And you can see that in, as an audience. You don't have to make film. You immediately recognize, ah, yes, yes, this is it, you know. As a director, do you have a situation where you think that a particular image is capturing the beauty of the actor, as you put it, but the actor disagrees? Or, I mean, what do you do in that kind of situation where your conception of care and beauty doesn't match with the person you're working with? The word beauty is, and care a little bit troublesome there, because the problem is not to make someone beautiful, it's to make that human being or that tree or that an so alive, so with the power of life, whether is young or old, something that demand um, a real <laughs> a real lot of care. Yeah, and it's not, so beauty is, yeah, it's the vibration of that person, of that tree. What, it's also true in painting, you know? Some, sometime you, you are watching a film or painting and you feel that vibration and you know it was the right way, you know? I mean, something was, somebody was at the right place to look and to film or to paint, and it's very moving. Nothing else matter, I guess, for sure, mm -hmm. yeah, for me. Abby, if you I feel like we should change up the order a little bit. I feel like we're <laughs> always leaving Mark to be last. Sure, um, Mark, you, could, you can uh, take this one. But yeah, just, you know, how, how do we justify caring about cinema, I guess, to put it very simply? I mean, it's very true what Claire said, that film is political, yeah? And that you really, uh, it's not possible, even this short film we watched tonight is very political. And, uh, the Czech master of non-fiction cinema, essayistic filmmaker Karel Vachek uh, once said, every shot I made, I made with the feeling I'm reading old newspapers. And I think th this is crucial, yeah, to create this kind, of, this kind of distance, dignity, but distance. And uh, there are so many things, you know, uh, we, we, we need to care when we are making uh, film. Uh, and to be honest in that certain moment, but knowing that you know it will be uh, sh edited maybe in months or years, and how this material will speak 
in that time. Mm. Yeah, I think this perspective uh, is super interesting. And uh, at Forum uh, this year, there is a film from magnificent Slovak director Jera Čakaniova, Notes from Eremosen. And it's about perspective of like dialogue between your virtual clone from future. Mm. And what the future will think about us is in this film realized through this uh, dialogue. Yeah? Uh, so, I, I, I mean, uh, we, we always think about us uh, uh, in context of past time. Yeah, uh, what our parents did, what our you know politicians did, what I did, how can I change it? But uh, we miss this kind of future perspective. Yeah, w where we are going, and I think for filmmaking or non-fiction filmmaking, or fiction filmmaking, whatever, experimental filmmaking for art, it's essential to connect us also with this perspective uh, from different time, and not the past but the future. Um, well, I think in traveling here, I caused the most harm to the planet compared to anyone sitting here on the stage because I flew here from the furthest. Well, you took a train, so you were like the least. Um, it's just four hours. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, coming here from LA, so there is, you know, that kind of answer. It's quite interesting because I have a couple of colleagues who now do not travel for film festivals. Um, both for a monetary reason, but also for environmental reasons. Um, I, I think that's also kind of a first world um, kind of position to take because what is so beautiful about film festivals is that we are forced to be in proximity with people that we would not normally be and we have to actually experience the humanity of people if you all come join us for the reception afterwards. Um, you know, we can rub shoulders with each other and smell each other and, um, you know, talk with each other and, um, you know, that's, that really is kind of the beauty of cinema, of cinematic spaces. They were chosen to be communal spaces, you know, deliberately developed so. Um, although less communal in the past when dinner halls and burlesque shows were more popular, but still, um, you know, quite different from what is the white box experience. Um, but I think that some of the more, for me personally, I think that some of the more utilitarian um, values of film are a little bit overblown because not every film is going to be preserved or archived for the future, but that doesn't mean that they shouldn't be valued or valuable or could be very meaningful to the people that they are made for, or maybe not. Um, but for me, it's more like, you know, a healthy cinematic culture is um, kind of a sign that it, it's a product of a healthy society. Um, and so to me, the two questions are kind of intertwined. You can't pull them apart because without a society that cares for its own people, I find it also quite interesting, the, you know, the, um, kind of the, con the, the term which translated to care citizenship from earlier, from um, Isabel's talk, because citizenship implies that people are citizens of a country, which means that it's actually inherently exclusionary as well. Um, and I don't actually think that exclusion is the opposite of care. There can be clear in the act of excluding or from as a former film festival programmer in that act of rejecting. Um, I know it doesn't feel that way to filmmakers here in the audience, um, but there can be care taken in those spaces. Um, all, all I'm saying is that like, to me, to care about cinema is to also care about the rest of the world that we're in and really not in a like films are going to change the world kind of way, but because there, there can be no healthy film culture without a healthy world. I want to pick up on what you said about care citizenship. I don't know the full context of that theory, but I think there's a way of thinking about citizenship that isn't statist, because the ideal conception of citizenship is something that has you have rights and responsibilities to fellow citizens. And I think that thinking about care in that way as something in which rights and responsibilities are equally balanced uh, makes a lot of sense to me. And that kind of leads into 
you know, question I have, all of you have uh, expressed some reservations with the term care, how it's been commodified, how it's been instrumentalized, branded. And I think a lot of that has to do with self-care. I mean, self-care is a hugely branded term now. And I find that term quite disturbing sometimes. I mean, self-care is like a whole kind of mode of capitalism now. You are sold so many things in the name of self-care. And I find that a bit disillusioning because it places the responsibility for care on the individual themselves, right? Mm -hmm. If you're burnt out of, at work, you, you know, if you work too many hours and you don't get paid enough, go to a spa. I mean, you know, it's like this kind of superficial solution where you just fix yourself is the message of self-care. And I think the kind of really political care we're all talking about has to be collective. You know, it's like people caring for each other and I'm curious, like in filmmaking and film institutions, paid exactly being paid enough is is being taken yeah. is being a form of being taken care of. Uh, care can mean money and resources. So I'm curious how each of you thinks about that in filmmaking and in film institutions. How do we build a collective form of care, a sustainable form of care where we take care of each other in a way that allows us to live healthy lives and not, you know, in addition to making good movies. Yes. A, a small parenthesis I wanted to say, as a filmmaker, as a female filmmaker, my budget are lower than male filmmaker, my salary are lower. So now taking care Self-care, um, I don't, I, I am always interested in knowing when I'm traveling because I prefer to have a cold apartment and to have no bus and short shower, but to be able to travel a little bit, you know, but I think uh, there is a something that brings a sort of link, maybe not citizenship, is not to see film alone at home, mm. but to go in a theater, even if there is only 10 per person in that theater, just to go there and to see a film with other person creates that link uh, so precious that cinema was made for that, you know? To be in your bed or on laying down alone at home makes, there is something a little bit strange for me, you know? Like a sort of masturbating thing, you know? I self care. Going, I mean, to go to the theater is is really something that brings a a link that it's maybe not as strong as citizenship, but you have to think. For instance, theater countries who have no more. I know countries who have no more theaters. Mm. I know some. Those countries have no more health care. You know, mm. it's it's the same. You don't need no, those theater anymore, and yeah. and you can uh, pay for your own um, stuff you need for treatment, whatever. Mm. I think, and suddenly it's a world of solitude. Mm. So self care. No, I prefer uh, the sort of togetherness. Mm. Yeah, that's a really good point that the defunding of welfare systems and healthcare often goes hand in hand with the defunding of culture. So it's, yeah. Abby, did you want to say something about just what collective care? care? Like? Yeah. yeah. 
I know it's an issue we have been talking about a lot in the US lately in the culture and, and culture and art mm -hmm. sector as there's been more and more unionization, more and more collectivization in this sector. And I know you and I have had a lot of conversations about yep. this. Yeah, so um, the organization that I work for, IDA, the International Documentary Association, is currently going through a union contract negotiation with um, our staff union, Documentary Workers United, which is part of CWA, the Communication Workers of America. Um, Full disclosure, I am not a part of the union because I have a director level position at the organization. Um, and so I'm, I'm finding this really interesting. And then when I was in graduate school, I was a part of a graduate student union that um, successfully collectivized um, and we passed with an overwhelming majority, something like 80% um, a vote to um, unionize, and um, so I kind of approach this both from the angle of having been a member of a union myself, and then now seeing this from the other side, um, and uh, there's an interesting tension that's happening kind of in terms of, um, I think, there are more relational ways of working that I would hope to have um, in terms of kind of management and staff relationships that are kind of being forced through this process that is built for for-profit corporations, for its workers to be able to claim a bit of say in managerial decisions um, when, and, and perhaps when it comes to film unions, for instance, and um, sharing in the profits of a lot of what is currently being made. Um, and I find this a little bit awkwardly applied when it comes to the nonprofit space, not because um, nonprofits don't bring value or make money, um, they just put it back into the organization as opposed to benefiting shareholders, um, but there is something that is, I find kind of inflexible about this. And I'm, I don't know what I'm saying, actually, because, but like, I'm not against kind of communal care, but I think because the way that it's systematized is kind of within structures that are so not good at taking care of, like the union structure is something that workers have to resort to because this is, the default model is, you know, owner takes all and benefits benefits the most from it. Um, so yeah, those are kind of where I'm kind of sitting at and thinking because for sure, like um, I'm benefiting from my association with the organization and because of that, you know, um, I'm here on stage because the market at Berlin Film Festival um, has invited me onto panels and you know certain experts and all of that, um, which allows me then to come to events like this, which don't have the budget to pay for me and all of that. But ultimately, like you know, the institutions stay and the workers come and go, even management. Um, and that, I think maybe I'll stop talking now because this is not fully formed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I think you're pointing to something you know, uh, questions of, you know, how, how can collectives or collectivization be, like, endure and... Oh, wait, actually, I remember where I was going with okay. this. I'm so sorry, I'm glad everyone. it was helpful. Okay, because, okay, because the very idea of collectivization is politicized and has value these days. That's where I was going. Um, that we see this also, another trend, um, is that, um, and uh, for instance, we see it at um, Berlin in the Forum Extended program. There is a section dedicated to the Young Guitar Film Collective, which you've written about, Devika, and they, the films are amazing. Um, and I really see kind of a special, uh, every single film festival that I've been to in the last two years has done some sort of retrospective section on film collectives um, ones that um, operate more collectively and ones that really just kind of work on each other's films um, and they, it's, it's not necessarily reflective of the hierarchies within the organizations themselves, but kind of the idea of collectivity 
has power and feels like the right way of going. And that's also, I think, just the same way as I'm a little bit wary of um, kind of the good faith put into the word care. I'm also a little bit wary of, of the good faith that we're putting into collectivity. Right, I mean, collectivity does not in and of itself mean that everything is perfect, but it does, it does afford people more power than they have as an individual in our world today. And it allows for more opportunities and relations of care, right? Yes, but is it but is it like the symptom or is it the cure? You know what I mean? Like, um, like for instance, it, it's the foam collectives that I see being uplifted are, are foam collectives from, like, third cinema, really, mm -hmm. right? Um, or or black filmmakers um, in the U.S. and in the U.K. Um, and to me, I find this quite interesting because at the moment that quote unquote marginalized filmmakers are. Um, getting acclaim for maybe the artistry of their work. It's not them as individuals that are actually being honored that are getting the acclaim. It's like this collective, you know what I mean? It's actually a form of distributing power um, if you think of it from the good side, but it's also perhaps a way of denying acclaim or flowers or kind of justification. I'm not saying it's always one way or another. I'm just, I'm finding this kind of quite interesting because there are some collectives that I see even um, you know, traveling the film festival circuit a lot that really only have like one member who is constant, right? So it would really be like in the music world, it would be like, you know, the name of the person and the blank, blank, blank as the band name, right? Not the blank, blank, blank as the band name. So I just find this kind of an interesting mm. phenomenon that's happening. Uh -huh. May I, sorry, may I intervene uh, just briefly from the audience side? Um, one, uh, I, would, I could listen to you talk forever, um, but I will have to uh, ask you to come off stage and have drinks with us very soon. Uh, but I wanted to intrude with a, with a question from my side, um, because we promised the audience also a little bit of talk about um, the industry in which we work. Um, I'm very interested in a very simple question. Do you feel the, the, t the role you have within this industry in which we all are working, um, does it allow you to take care of yourself and of others? I'm not working in an industry. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I'm sorry. I, I was... Industry in filmmaking is a certain type of film. So I'm not in the film industry. I'm in cinema. Mm. Yeah. No, it's true. Sometimes I regret, you know. I would love to be in the film industry. I'm not. But, uh, but maybe if we could think of industry more broadly, Claire. I mean, the process of having to raise money for films, because film is a very capital-intensive art form, right? But uh, it's a very lonely. Um, this week and the week before and the next week, me and my producer, we are looking for money. You know, it's not industrial. It's two of us. Maybe a third person will come to join us, but it's. Uh, um, I know what is film industry. I've seen it, and I. Uh, but I'm not part of it, you know. Mm. Um, I'm part of a uh, another uh, club of film. I don't know. It's not the same one. It's not industrial, because I I was I visit an actor I know. In, he was Batman on the last Batman, <laughs> and I. Who, the who crew, could you be the, talking the, about? Yeah, <laughs> the crew, they, they were stopped for six months, and then another three months. It took them two years and a half, and uh, Robert was obliged to stay in the same hotel, not to meet his family, blah blah blah, mm. because the crew was more than 500. Mm. So I, I told him, how strange it could be 
Of course, you know by the end, you know the name of 50 person, but you don't remember, you don't, you cannot call more than 500 person by their nickname, you know? Me, I know everyone, you know? And when R Robert was working with me, he knew the name of everyone. We were like 27 or 30, you know? Mm. So, industrial create another type of loneliness, a very different type of loneliness, which leads people to, um, to have charity, which is another type of care, mm. you know? You ask why, yeah, we must have charity because, you know, we are in this film industry and no, I'm not, for me, it's, um, I, I'm not, it's, I'm not an elite at all, you know, but I was never invited in the industry. Mm. And if I was invited, would I say yes? I don't know. Um, if I put it this way, do you feel compensated for what you do, or do you even think that way? Compensated? It's uh, strange. I sometimes I'm very happy while doing, and with the crew and the actor, because it's very strong, you know. After the film is finished, is the compensation is uh, is not the right word. It's uh, back to a sort of a lonely road, you know. Mm. But during shooting, sometime it's more than compensation. It's uh, very, it's a big fire, you know. Mm. Mm. Very warm, yeah. Difficult too, but it's it's warm, yeah. Mm. Marek, why don't you take this one? Uh -huh. Well, uh, briefly, you know, Czech culture is very much rooted in texts. So that's why, for example, you have this motto, thinking through film. And when there was this 10th edition of our festival, we had slogan, never been better. And it was really like, uh, you know, provocative for many people, but I mean it that still, even, you know, times are changing, uh, we still can say it, never been better. Uh, for most of the people, they would have m much less comfortable lives in 30, 80, 150 years ago. Uh, so I think th th this is one point of view that, uh, of course, uh, we challenge many things, but uh, we can be happy that we still have uh, certain conditions. The, the other slogan we have is, to dream is to work. Uh, so, you know, w when somebody says that uh, he is a dreamer, we have the feeling that he's someone yeah, always with his head uh, in the clouds. But no, to, to dream, it's really like uh, something you are taking seriously, uh, the position you are in and thinking where you can move. So I think th this, is, uh, this is also uh, very crucial. And it's about fighting, yeah? I think uh, we are fighting, and it's a privilege, as Susan Zontag said, uh, being filmmaker is a privilege. And uh, that doesn't mean that we are privileged, but that it is a privilege, yeah? Mm -hmm. And uh, some of my friends or former colleagues from film school, uh, for different reasons, decided to uh, go to make commercials, yeah? They, because they needed uh, money, they needed to pay, w whatever. And uh, only few of them uh, remain filmmakers. Mm. They are making commercials, but most of them, uh, you know, really stopped making uh, cinema. Yeah, so th this is uh, what's industry or like, uh, and, and it's about decision, yeah? W what kind of lives, uh, it's not about judging, yeah? But it's about decisions, where do you want to be part of? and. Uh, and m maybe uh, because we are getting, uh, I think, to the very end, uh, I have one joke, yeah? Uh, um, my f favorite joke uh, from Bill Clinton uh, era, 
uh, Bill Clinton is sitting in the restaurant around the table having a conversation uh, with his fellows and uh, saying, you know, during my presidency, I really uh, created many, many new jobs. And the waiter who is giving him water is saying, that's true. Before your presidency, I had one work and now I have three. I need to have uh, three jobs to survive. Uh, so I, I think really like the crucial thing if we should dream is the distribution of wealth. But uh, from Western perspective, usually it's connected to capitalism. But uh, we know that it's the same in authoritarian regimes, in totalitarian regimes. So it's more about mankind. And if we can change something, this is something what should be changed, how to distribute money in the society. Because also it was, for example, uh, uh, mentioned in this ethical conference that filmmakers don't have enough money, so they are in stress, they don't have enough time to make proper shootings, to, uh, they are stressed in editing rooms, and if they are financed by institutions like televisions, it's even more complicated. So I think, uh, yeah, m money is uh, something we should think about. Abby, would you like a final final word? I mean, I think it's already been said. Yeah. Money. <laughs> I, I, I would like to say something to you, because of you. I was thinking every week, every month, the number of multimillionaire are in the newspaper and there is like a sort of, uh, it's like a <coughs> stardust around earth of few millionaires who rule the world. And I think I was not born in a world like that. Mm -hmm. My parents never raised me for a world like that. And now, I am in a world like that, and I, I am, it's really hard to accept, yeah. Thank you so much, Claire, Abby, Marek, for joining us tonight. Thank you all for coming and staying through this discussion. Yeah, <laughs> through this very long evening. And please join us uh, for the reception. Thank you very much, Devika. Thank you.